Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Well, I can't really see you, can I? You can see me, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Good to have you with us this morning. Let's begin our time together for worship with a prayer. This prayer that I'm going to pray this morning um, is the New Zealand's version of the Lord's Prayer. And I'll put the words on the screen here so you can join me. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven, The hallowing of your name echo through the universe, The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, Your heavenly will be done by all created beings, your commonwealth of peace and freedom, sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in gl the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Let us worship God together. first lesson comes from Jonah, chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days' walk across. Jonah began to go to the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned away from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity they'd said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Psalm 62 For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock. 
my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Here ends the psalm. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water where they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him leaving their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men. you
I was super tempted to skip my uh, sermon altogether this week and just read for you or play you the video of Amanda Gorman's reading her brilliant poem, The Hill We Climb, that she wrote for the inauguration this past Wednesday. Did you all watch that? If you're like me, you've watched it <laughs> more than once. She was amazing. Not only her writing skills, but her oratory skills at such a young age, outstanding. One might think that Amanda Gorman was blessed with the natural talent of public speaking, but then we hear that she struggled to overcome a speech impediment. Initially, I thought, here's this gifted, beautiful, perfect young woman with a trouble-free life that has led her smooth sailing to the presidential inauguration. But that's not the case. In reality, we all know that is rarely the case in anyone's life. And yet we still think about it in other people. We often think about it when it comes to folk also in the Bible. We get the impression that the Bible is full of these pious saints that, you know, never question God, who never doubt, never sin, never swear, never get depressed, never have financial problems, never have troubled marriages, disobedient children, and certainly never want to tell God to take a long walk off a short pier. You know what I mean? On the surface, it seems like the Old Testament is nothing but unquestioning heroes. You know, there's Abraham and Sarah who move out with only a promise and a prayer. And then we have Moses who heads for Egypt with nothing but a shepherd's crook and Aaron to write his sermons. <laughs> And then Elijah, who bravely faces 450 prophets of Baal. And then all over the New Testament, we hear these stories of people that are getting up and following Jesus, getting up and going to where God calls them without question. Today, we hear of the fishermen that drop their nets without a second thought tax collectors who are forgetting about credit and debt, people who are leaving their parents behind in boats. <laughs> Later on, we hear about a man named Paul who travels the Mediterranean spreading the good news. Now, I'm sure there are more to the story when it comes to all of these folks. That simply isn't written down, so we don't know all the details and all the stories. So we can't relate to them. But there's one person in the Bible that without question we can relate to, at least I can. And that person is Jonah. Jonah is my kind of missionary, reluctant, withdrawn, stubborn, never quite ready to go where God is calling him. I feel like that sometimes, you know? Instead of going where God calls him to go, he goes in the totally opposite direction. Jonah is completely human, completely sinful, and he doesn't even try to hide it. He doesn't pretend to be pious or holy. He simply tries to run away from God. In some ways, I appreciate his honesty the reason Jonah doesn't want to go is also altogether human and a bit humorous as well. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because Jonah doesn't want God to be gracious to the Ninevites. Jonah doesn't want God to forgive them, to love them, or to deal kindly with them. Pretty human, huh? Jonah doesn't think there's anything wrong with this. He thinks his position is valid. <laughs> Those Ninevites are awful. <laughs> they deserve what's coming to them. After all, Jonah is not killing them himself or actively discriminating against them himself. He just doesn't want to preach to them. 
He just doesn't want God to love them the same way God loves Jonah. After all, Jonah is an insider and wants God to be the God of insiders only. But here in this story, God shows love and mercy to a bunch of outsiders. The point of the whole book of Jonah is to get the reader to wrestle with the question, on whom should God have mercy? God's answer, answer of course, is everyone. But that is not always our answer. We want God to disapprove of who we disapprove of. You know what I'm talking about? We all have people or groups of people we don't approve of. People that we'd like to think are outside of God's grace and mercy. For some, those people might be Republicans or Democrats, people who have differing views than us when it comes to war, the economy, abortion, immigration, or gun control. People of different faiths, ethnicities, or nationalities. People who have committed, committed crimes that we think are unforgivable. Perhaps people who have different gender identities or expressions. Basically, it could be anyone who is different from us. Anyone who we think of as other. With our nation so divided these days, that list of other can be pretty long. We want God to reject those we reject. And when that doesn't happen, we don't like it one bit. Seriously, I know you all know that anger. Jonah was so angry and annoyed by that, he thought it would be better if he just died. But God is gracious and merciful to all, whether we like it or not. And in this story, God basically says to Jonah, deal with it, accept it, and in fact, enjoy it and rest in it. So the question comes to us, how willing are we to let God be God? How willing are we to let God be merciful to who God will be merciful to? Salvation is pure gift and grace. And Jonah's story reminds us that we do not own that grace, nor is it ours to dole out as we wish. God will be forgiving because that is the very heart of God. The Jonah story is much more than a cute little Sunday school story about a whale. Its message is meant for those mature enough to understand the ways of God and to face the ways we try to lay claim to God and God's gift of grace. Someone once said that if a person did not believe that God would save the most foul of humans, then that person did not really believe in God's power to save their own soul. Thank God that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing because we all need it. Amen.
I now invite you to join me in the creed. We are not alone. We are in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for disciples, teachers, and all followers of Jesus, for deacons and deaconesses, and for musicians and servers, that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, for nonprofits and non governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in just use of wealth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcast and all who await relief that in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, and for the organizations that serve others, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith, whose lives serve as an example for gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
And now may God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, bless you this day and give you strength, mercy, and grace along your way now and forever. Amen. Go in God's peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.